Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. I'm your host, Carrie Parker. Today we have episode 353 for December 4th, 2023. And we've got a monster episode for you today. I am almost sure that we are going to go long. And uh, nevertheless, I'm going to try to make this a bit of a lightning round. We got a lot to cover this week. Uh, we've got our last live news show for 2023. And I'll explain all of that after I go through the news. But basically, I have engineered it for myself so I could <laughs> take a break and take off the rest of this year. But I've got plenty of new content already lined up and pre-scheduled for you. I'll get into all that after the news. So I've got a lot of things to tell you, actually. So, so be sure to stay tuned after the news segment, because I've got a lot of things to tell you about what's coming up in the next month or two. So real quick, some public service announcements before I kind of give the rundown of the news stories. Uh, if you've got an iPhone or iPad or a Mac, make sure you update right away. There's been a point release with some important security updates in it, so make sure you get those updated. Also, if you're a Chrome browser user, make sure you update Chrome or maybe take this opportunity to switch to something more privacy respecting like Firefox or Brave or Safari if you're a purely Mac user. Also, for the few of you out there that even know what own cloud is, if you are running an instance of this or if you are using an instance of this, you need to get it updated ASAP. There were some really, really bad, like scored 10.0 CVE bugs found in own cloud and they are being actively sought out and exploited. Uh, it's a real, real mess. So if you happen to know what that means, and you uh, are in charge of or know somebody who's in charge of an own cloud instance, uh, you need to get that remediated right away. But okay, we've got a lot of news stories for you to cover too. I've actually brought in a couple that I skipped last time that I wanted to get to, and I was kind of hoping this week would be a light week. It is not. Um, so I've got more than the usual amount of news stories today, and I'm going to try to cover them a little more quickly than normal to try to keep this tight and within, <laughs> within an hour, but I'm probably going to fail. But uh, I've got a story about how some Iranian hackers are trying to exploit PLCs, which is short for programmable logic controllers. These are often used in utilities and public works, and they had been focusing outside the U.S., in particular Israel, but uh, they've also now targeted one in the U.S. And related to that, we're going to talk about how CISA has just launched a pilot program to address critical infrastructure threats. Some Google Drive users are complaining of missing files. And while it's not affecting a lot of people, it does bring up an important point that I want to make. Plex users uh, have run across a new feature that is rather creepy and disturbing that is sharing what you're watching with your friends and family. An article from Rolling Stone about how they were able to use very easily available public information to spy on, in this case, they picked a, a sensationalistic location. They picked Mar-a-Lago, uh, Trump's quote-unquote Southern White House. And the, the point of the story being how easy it is for anybody to do. I've got a related story about how data brokers are selling even more sensitive information, creating a national security risk. I've got a related story from MIT Technology Review about how a lot of U.S. military personnel's privacy is in danger from similar selling of data broker information. I've got a rather unfortunate story about how a court has ruled that automakers can continue to record and intercept your text messages in your car. A rather interesting story from 404 Media about how the CEO of a smart mattress topper inadvertently maybe revealed how much information they are gathering about their customers. A telling article that actually came out a long time ago, but for some reason I just ran across it recently, about how people who sell and buy used homes need to be thinking about the implications of IoT devices left in the house. There's been a lot of sensationalistic headlines about Apple's new name drop feature and how it's this horrible privacy problem for children, and it's it's not. I'll explain that. And there's actually a little bit of good news. Uh, there's a welcome article uh, about how Zelle is finally starting to reimburse people for being scammed in very specific circumstances. And we'll wrap it up with a report from Malwarebytes about how little people are actually availing themselves of available security practices that we all should be doing with some interesting statistics. And then finally, I'll do a very brief tip of the week about email aliases. This is something I've actually talked a lot about on the show, and I've got a, a series of two articles coming out in my newsletter and blog 
and I'm going to touch on them kind of lightly here because, well, for one thing, I'm going to be short on time today, but also because I've covered them a lot here and I really want to just kind of draw your attention to it because I had not really documented this in uh, a good blog article and now I have. All right. So plenty to talk about. Let's get to the news. All right. First up, this is from the Hacker News. The U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA, man, that it just does not roll off the tongue. I wish they had picked a better name for that. Okay, CISA revealed that it's responding to a cyber attack that involved the active exploitation of Unitronics Programmable Logic Controllers, or PLCs, to target the Municipal Water Authority of, I'm going to mess this up, Alakipa? in Western Pennsylvania. The attack has been attributed to an Iranian-based hacktivist collective known as Cyber Avengers. This is, and this is a quote from someone at CISA saying, quote, cyber threat actors are targeting PLCs associated with water and wastewater systems facilities, including an unidentified Unitronics PLC at a U.S. water facility. In response, the affected municipality's water authority immediately took the system offline and switched to manual operations. There is no known risk to the municipality's drinking water or water supply, end quote. According to news reports quoted by the Water Information Sharing and Analysis Center, Cyber Avengers is alleged to have seized control of the booster station that monitors and regulates pressure for Raccoon and Potter townships. It's thought that the threat actors access the affected device, a Unitronics Vision Series PLC, with a human-machine interface, or HMI, by taking advantage of lax password security and being publicly accessible over the internet. With PLCs being used in the WWS sector to monitor various stages and processes of water and wastewater treatment, disruptive attacks attempting to compromise the integrity of such critical processes can have adverse impacts, preventing WWS facilities from providing access to clean, potable water. To mitigate such attacks, CISA is recommending that organizations change the Unitronics PLC default password, enforce multi-factor authentication, disconnect the PLCs from the internet, back up the logic and configurations of any Ultronics PLCs to enable fast recovery, and apply the latest updates. Cyber Avengers has a history of targeting the critical infrastructure, se- infrastructure sector, claiming to have infiltrated as many as 10 water treatment stations in Israel. Last month, the group also claimed responsibility for a major cyber assault on ORPAC systems, a prominent provider of gas station solutions in the country. So yeah, this is something that we talked with Josh Corman about extensively, and that has led to CISA taking a more active role in trying to help companies, as particular critical infrastructure companies, address these needs. That leads me to my next story. This is from Dark Reading, just briefly. Last week, CISA announced that it is launching a pilot program designed to provide cybersecurity services to critical infrastructure entities in need. The blog post, written by Eric Goldstein, Executive Assistant Director for Cybersecurity at the agency, detailed how cyber attacks are affecting the day-to-day operations of critical infrastructure organizations and are increasing in volume and impact, citing the ransomware attack on Colonial Pipeline and increasingly advanced threat actors that specialize in critical infrastructure. CESA will be hosting roundtables and information systems with partners in every sector and region to understand the, quote, unique needs and challenges, identify gaps in existing capabilities, assess interest in our shared services, and identify ways CISA can provide more scalable support through shared services or other means, unquote, for critical infrastructure organizations. Critical infrastructure entities that are currently included in the pilot program exist in healthcare, water, and K-12 education in its first phase, but CISA plans to provide its services to 100 different entities this year across sectors. Interested organizations can contact a security advisor at a CISA office in the region to potentially participate in the pilot program. So yes, if you are involved in the healthcare industry and public utilities or in K-12 education or any basic critical infrastructure, know that CISA has programs to help you with your security and to help monitor your systems for problems and has all sorts of free programs to improve our security. Absolutely take advantage of those resources because in a lot of cases, a lot of these companies just do not have the expertise uh, or the time or the funds to, to do what absolutely needs to be done. So make sure that you look into the options that you already have freely available to you through the U.S. government. All right, next up, uh, this is from Apple Insider. It's about Google Drive users who uh, are complaining that they are missing some of their files. 
Cloud storage service Google Drive is losing user files, and engineers warn users to avoid making changes or troubleshooting while the issue is investigated and resolved. Cloud storage solutions like iCloud or Google Drive allow users to access files from anywhere, but are far from perfect systems. As with any data container, users must keep data backups to prevent accidental data loss. Some users are learning this the hard way, as Google Drive seems to have dumped random amounts of data for some users. According to a report from Android Police, multiple users have taken to forums to share similar missing file issues with Google Drive. The earliest report of missing files on Google Drive comes from a South Korean user. On November 21st, the user shared that its Google Drive account reverted to a file structure from May of 2023, losing all new files and changes that occurred since. A Google Drive employee replied to the thread on November 27th, sharing that the team is, quote, investigating reports of an issue impacting a limited subset of Drive for desktop users and will follow up with more updates, unquote. The team member urges users not to click the, quote, unquote, disconnect account button within the Drive for Desktop app. Users should also avoid deleting or moving the app data folder. And if you don't know where that is, then you're fine. The Google Drive team member also recommends users create a copy of the app data folder if possible. While initial reports didn't specify where issues arose, either in the mobile app or on the web or on the desktop, the Google Drive team member clarified the issue. It seems to affect only a limited number of desktop app users like those on macOS or Windows. As was recommended, avoid editing or changing files in the application folder or signing out of the app. A fix will likely be found and issued through a future update. So uh, again, briefly, it sounds like this is limited. It's not happening to a lot of people. It also sounds like it's only affecting people who are using the Google Drive application for desktop computers. So not on your phone, not on your tablet. But if you're a Mac uh, user or a PC user and you have downloaded and installed the Google Drive app, which presumably gives you, you know, a folder of your Google Drive native uh, on your computer, that it's people that are using those apps that are finding uh, that some of their files have gone missing. And it sounds like maybe it's reverting back to a previous state of that folder, meaning you would lose new or changed stuff, uh, you know, from the last few months. So uh, what I really want to take away from this article is, Yes, you absolutely need to back these things up. And as soon as I read this article myself, I have over the years used Google Docs for several things. For example, I use it for my show notes. I just honestly, I just have not found a better web-based note app than Google Docs. It's it's really, really good. I wish it weren't so good because I'd love to use something else, but it, it's got all the features I need. It's fully compatible with Microsoft Office, which I also use. So anyway, be that as it may. I immediately went to go download a copy of everything in my Google Docs folder. And you could do this by going to takeout.google.com. And this is a general tool that Google allows you to download any and all of your Google data. And the way it works is it gives you a list of all the things you could download. You check the boxes for the, for the services, the Google services for which you want to download your data, a copy of your data, and you click uh, you know, submit. And then in the background, it goes off in chunks on this and eventually sends you an email with at least one, perhaps multiple uh, links to download a zip file for the requested information. And so what I did in particular in this case, because it's the, the one part of my Google stuff I really don't have backed up because I don't use the desktop app. I don't want to install that on my Mac. But that means that, you know, if for some reason Google went away tomorrow, uh, I would not have any of that data. And because I don't have a local copy on my Mac, then things like Time Machine or Backblaze or any of the other backup solutions I might have are also not making backup copies of that data. So if you're in the same situation, uh, you might do the same thing. So one thing I found out when I went to Google Takeout, which was interesting, is, is that you can actually schedule this to happen on a recurring basis, which I didn't realize. There was an option to... Uh, get your data every two months. And I think it said every two months for a year. Like, I don't know if that implies like that only does this six times and it, it's done or maybe it's every two months, you know, I don't know. I, I don't, don't understand why it said for a year, but anyway, I signed up for that. And so every two months, I hopefully will be getting an automated backup uh, with a link to download that from Google docs. And if not, I would have set a reminder for myself uh, to do this probably once a month or once every two months is probably fine for me anyway and to request this backup. And it will create copies of your documents in multiple formats. I think PDF was an option. I chose the Microsoft Office formats because I use Microsoft Office. So that was more convenient for me. But there, there are several options there. Now, if you do use the Google Drive desktop app, you 
potentially have this problem that this article just talked about. But if you did do that, then there would be copies of these documents resident on your local machine, which then would allow, you know, regular backup software or backup utilities to make copies of those for you. All right, let's move on. I got so much more to cover. Uh, this next one is from 404 Media, and it's about Plex. And Plex was in the news not that long ago for LastPass because it was a LastPass engineer who was running their Plex server at home and making that Plex server available over the broader internet that allowed uh, that engineer to be hacked. First, the Plex server was hacked, and then once they basically had a beachhead inside that person's network on their Plex server, they were able to branch out and eventually get to their LastPass business stuff. But anyway, Plex is a media server you could run where you can host your own stuff and you can share it with other people. And it turns out that uh, it got a little too sherry. So again, from 404 Media. Many Plex users were alarmed when they got a week in review email last week that showed them what they and their friends had watched on the popular media server software. Some users are saying that their friends' softcore porn habits are being revealed to them with this feature, while others are horrified by the potentially invasive nature more broadly. Plex is a hybrid streaming service self-hosted media server. In addition to offering content that Plex itself has licensed, the service allows users to essentially roll their own streaming service by making locally downloaded files available to stream over the internet to devices that the server admin owns. You can also friend people on Plex and give them access to your own server. A new feature called Discover Together expands social aspects of Plex and introduces an activity tab. And the quote here, I guess, is from Plex, quote, see what your friends have watched, rated and added to their watch lists or shared with you, unquote. It also shares this activity in a week in review email that is sent to Plex users and people who have access to their servers. This has greatly alarmed a wide swath of Plex's user base who have blown up the Plex forums, the Discover Together blog post comment section and Reddit with posts about disastrous overshares created by the feature. And here's a, here's a quick sampling of a few of the posts. One says, Discover Together and We Can Review emails are a massive breach of privacy and trust. Another one says, Security breach. Why is my friend receiving notifications to rate movies I've watched? And another says, Weekly Review emails data leak. Plex crossed a line with your Week in Review emails today. Now, the feature is opt-out, meaning many people were very surprised to get these emails and see this feature, as it's up to users to proactively turn it off. And this article has instructions on how to do that. So you might want to look it up if you're a Plex user. And this is another quote from one of the Plex user forums. It says, quote, I can see that one of my friends is apparently watching a ton of cheesy soft porn stuff. Think classic Skinamax fare from some server. It's not mine or Plex channel. And I am 100% sure they would be mortified to know that I know this, unquote. And then this article has a little update at the bottom. It says, after this article was published, a Plex spokesperson told 404 Media that, quote, Plex did roll out a full screen onboarding process for every user, along with an email announcement and in-app announcement for the launch of Discover Together. That said, many users became aware of this feature for the first time last week when Plex sent out the activity emails. Based on the comments in the forums and Reddit, users who were unaware that their watch activity was being shared to friends and family may have clicked through these settings during the onboarding process without reading their selections, unquote. They added that, quote, Plex does not generate community activity for known adult titles. The Skinamax type of content you refer to in the article may not all be tagged as adult, so that is why these titles may surface in watch activity, unquote. So obviously, if you are a Plex user, I'm a Plex user, but I don't share it with anybody. It's In fact, I don't poke holes in my firewall for it either. I only use it for my devices inside my house. But first of all, obviously, if you are a Plex user, you, you need to be aware of this, though you may have uh, found out about it recently like this, these other people did. And so there is a way to opt out of this. You should go to this article to click those links to find out. You can also just stop sharing with friends. But the bigger issue here is that this stuff just keeps happening. It's it's like the Venmoization of these apps. I don't know what possesses these companies to start offering these social media type features that are turned on by default that you would have to opt out of. But just be aware that this is happening and just take this as a general guideline to share as little as possible with anybody. All right, let's move on. This is from Rolling Stone and it was a much, much longer article, but I'm going to just read you parts of it here. 
Spying on presidents used to be a tough business. One of the great unsung heroes of American history was a formerly enslaved woman named Mary Bowser, a spy who infiltrated the family of Jefferson Davis as a domestic servant and eventually landed a full-time job in the Southern White House, the political seat of his confederacy. Armed with a photographic memory and an all-access pass to the inner workings of the Davis administration, she fed details daily to the Union Army, which Ulysses S. Grant called the quote-unquote most valuable information he received from the Southern Capitol during the war. These days, it's a whole lot easier. While researching our new book, The Secret Life of Data, we gathered some sensitive information from Mar-a-Lago, Donald Trump's Palm Beach Club, which he used as a base for political operations both during and after his presidency. He even referred to this on several occasions as his Southern White House. We didn't have to risk life and limb, posing as the help and smuggling information out through a well-funded spy ring. All we had to do was sign up for an online service, enter the address of Mar-a-Lago, and click a button. Within a few minutes, we had a report profiling thousands of visitors to Trump's club over the course of an entire year, including details like where they likely live and work, their ages, incomes, ethnicities, education levels, where they were immediately before visiting, and where they spent their time on the property once they got there. This wasn't some dark web hacker thing. No Bitcoin was exchanged. The service we used was perfectly legal and freely available on the open web, one of dozens of data brokers that collect and trade in consumer data, about the same as the gross domestic product of Hong Kong. This particular data broker, called NIR, uses smartphone location data to trace the foot traffic of about 1.6 billion people across 70 million locations in 44 countries. NIR isn't set up to spy on U.S. presidents, current or former. Their typical customer is a retail business using location data to track the origin points of visitors to brick and mortar stores so it can market more effectively. But on the other hand, it's not not set up to spy on presidents either. Once data gets collected and analyzed, there's no telling who's going to use it or for what purposes. It has its own secret life. And that can be pretty dangerous both for individual privacy and at a bigger scale for democracy itself. That's the main point of our book and the reason we wanted to see what we could do with Nears data. We managed to spy on a sitting president in his own home from the comfort of our couches just by messing with the free version of a single data broker's web app. Now imagine what a dedicated forensic team could do, working 24-7 with access to the full paid services of every commercial data broker in addition to all of the other data sources out there, from high-tech hacking to old-fashioned surveillance. It's one of those cases where reality is actually worse than the stories told in dystopian sci-fi and superhero movies. That's why, if we're ever going to get out of this mess, preserving individual privacy and the conditions for functional democracy, we all need to start thinking about technology the same way we think about supervillains. When Congress writes new laws, when big tech companies introduce new tools to the market, and when businesses and consumers invite new apps and gadgets into their homes and workplaces, it's not enough just to take tech at face value. A data broker is never just a marketing service, and a crappy poker app is never just a game. They're cracks in the foundation of our society, and they can be exploited to tear it apart. So from here on in, every conversation about the future of technology needs to begin with someone asking, what's the worst that could happen? Because we guarantee you it will. I don't have a lot to add to that, <laughs> but it's it's a perfect example of, of what you could do with some of these services. And yeah, I mean, that's just one service with the free version. It's, it's horrific. We've got to stop this rampant data collection and selling. Speaking of which, here's an article from 9to5Mac about another data broker story. A new report says that personal information sold by data brokers is even more sensitive and detailed than previously thought, making so-called anonymized data even easier to tie back to specific individuals. The report says that those buying data are able to target people working in extremely sensitive professions, including military personnel and quote-unquote decision makers working in national security roles. Data brokers are companies that buy personal data from a wide range of sources. Much of it is gathered from internet browsing history and app usage. Data is supposed to be anonymized. That is, it should be possible for someone buying the data to know who you are, for example, a 30-year-old man living in California who owns an iPhone 15 Pro Max and travels regularly to Las Vegas, but it should not be possible to specifically identify you by name. However, countless tests and studies have shown that we now collect such a huge range of data that it is often trivial for a buyer to identify specific individuals and even U.S. troop movements in war zones. 
Location data sold by the developers of many mobile apps makes this especially easy. How many people leave your home address each morning and travel to your workplace, for example? An investigation by a nonprofit found that much more sensitive occupation data is being sold than was previously known. And this is a quote from the uh, ICCL, the Irish Council for Civil Liberties. You may remember that name from my interviews with Johnny Ryan. Uh, And this quote says, an investigation by the Irish Council for Civil Liberties, the ICCL, reveals widespread trade and data about sensitive European personnel and leaders that puts them at risk of blackmail, hacking and compromise, and undermines the security of their organizations and institutions. ICCL has today published two reports, Europe's Hidden Security Crisis and America's Hidden Security Crisis, that reveal how extraordinarily sensitive information about key EU and U.S. figures and military personnel flows to foreign states and non-state actors through online advertising's real-time bidding system. This system is active on almost all websites and apps. And by the way, those uh, the titles of those are links, so if you want to read those reports, you can go through the show notes to find them. The Financial Times reports that occupation data includes judges, elected officials, military personnel, and decision makers working in national security. Although RTB or real-time bidding data is intended to be used only for ad targeting, it can be exploited for other uses. App usage could reveal that someone is gay and closeted, for example, while web browsing data could reveal searches for embarrassing sexual or medical problems. One academic says this creates the clear potential for blackmail. Carissa Veliz, uh, who wrote uh, that book, Privacy is Power, who I've wanted to have on the show forever, an associate professor at Oxford University specializing in digital ethics said that, quote, although platforms claim data is anonymized, it is actually very hard to do in practice. You only need two or three data points to identify somebody. Platforms know the anonymization they are doing is so fragile, and they know what they are doing is identifying sensitive information that could endanger people in society. Identifying sensitive jobs opens these people up to harms like extortion or blackmail, which could also impact democracy, unquote. So just to keep things rolling, here's yet another article about data abuse, and this is from MIT Technology Review. And this is a much longer article article that I've just taken bits and pieces from. Highly personal and sensitive information about military members, such as home addresses, health and financial information, and names of family members and friends is easily accessible to anybody who wants to anyone who wants to buy it. It's for sale for as little as 12 cents per record by U.S.-based data brokers. That's the finding of a new report from Duke University researchers that shows how data brokers are selling this sort of information with minimal vetting to customers both domestically and overseas, creating major privacy and national security risks. First, take a look at just how personal the information is that researchers were able to purchase, from a person's net worth to whether they have diabetes. The Duke team purchased a total of eight different data sets from three brokers, which they don't identify by name in the report. But the chart below, and unfortunately, this whole article has multiple charts, which I am not going to try to describe to you. If you're interested in this, uh, look in the show notes for for the charts. The chart below is sorted by data sets, and you can see that some information, like emails and home addresses, is widely accessible through multiple providers. I, for one, was surprised to see how frequently information about their children and homeowner status came up. Another concerning finding, to use the lead researcher's word, was the broker's willingness to sell this information to clients outside the U.S., The researchers who were particularly interested in the national security risk created by the industry set up an email address from a U.S.-based domain and one from an Asia-based domain, which they sent from an IP address in Singapore. As I detail in the story, these brokers conducted minimal vetting regardless of where the inquiry came from, and almost all of them ultimately provided many of the same types of information, no matter the geographic source of the request. Here, I've broken out what types of data are available based on the origin of the request. And again, this is a chart that you can't see. It's worth noting that these results are just a reflection of the data the researchers purchased and do not provide a comprehensive view of what the industry sells and to whom. That is to say, just because the researchers did not get health data when inquiring from an Asia-based domain doesn't mean it's not possible to purchase this data through other providers. Additionally, the specific fields do vary across the different categories. The part of the report that was perhaps most astonishing to me concerns the economic model of the brokers, which incentivizes clients to buy in bulk and greatly erode people's privacy. The more data someone purchases, the cheaper it gets. One broker sent pricing options to the researchers to demonstrate how this model works, which you can see from the graph below. And it's, again, again, that's another graph, but the, the cost per record went down dramatically depending on how many you bought. 
the data the Duke researchers purchased ranged from 12 cents to 32 cents per record, mere pennies to violate the privacy of U.S. military members. As one of the report authors, Haley Barton, told me, quote, In practice, it seems as though anyone with an email address, a bank account, and a few hundred dollars could acquire the same type of data that we did, unquote. Okay, so I just rattled off three stories in a row with, from slightly different angles, but the obvious point of all of these is the same. These data brokers are running wild. They are collecting tons and tons of personal data that they claim is anonymized, that they claim can't be used to identify individuals, but it can. It doesn't take much to cross-reference some of these data sets to figure these things out, especially when you're collecting location data. And this is a real, real problem, not just for privacy, but for national security and for democracy. We have got to get a handle on this. We have got to regulate it. We have got to, we've got to fix this data broker problem. So I've got even more stories about this. Let, let's keep going. This one's from the record. A federal judge on Tuesday refused to bring back a class action lawsuit alleging four automakers had violated Washington state's privacy laws by using vehicles onboard infotainment systems to record and intercept customers private text messages and mobile phone call logs. The Seattle based appellate judge ruled that the practice does not meet the threshold for a legal privacy violation under state law handing a big win to automakers Honda, Toyota, Volkswagen, and General Motors, which are defendants in five related class action suits focused on the issue. One of those cases against Ford has been dismissed on appeal previously. The plaintiffs in the four live cases had appealed a prior judge's dismissal, but the appellate judge ruled Tuesday that the interception and recording of mobile phone activity did not meet the Washington Privacy Act's standard that a plaintiff must prove that, quote, his or her business, his or her person, or his or her reputation, unquote, has been threatened. In an example of the issues at stake, plaintiffs in one of the five cases filed a suit against Honda in 2021, arguing that beginning in at least 2014, infotainment systems in the company's vehicles began downloading and storing a copy of all text messages on smartphones when they were connected to the system. An Annapolis, Maryland-based company, Birla Corporation, provides the technology to some car, car manufacturers but does not offer it to the general public, the lawsuit, the lawsuit said. Once messages are downloaded, Birla's software makes it impossible for vehicle owners to access their communications and call logs but does provide law enforcement with access, the lawsuit said. Many car manufacturers are selling car owners' data to advertisers as a revenue-boosting tactic, according to earlier reporting by Recorded Future News. Automakers are exponentially increasing the number of sensors they place in their cars every year with little regulation of the practice. So quick plug here for privacy for cars. Uh, if you've recently sold a vehicle or rented, even rented a car or had one repossessed, uh, basically any car where you've connected your, your smartphone to it, uh, there may be a bunch of data on there that you might want to get deleted and you can use privacy for cars service to do this. And then I think our last story about uh, data gathering, and this is another one from 404 Media, and, and this is a really interesting one. Uh, but again, it highlights how smart devices are learning lots of things about us that we might not be thinking about. Is the OpenAI CEO drama causing a public health crisis in San Francisco? The CEO of 8Sleep, a buzzy smart mattress topper popular with tech workers, thinks possibly... Matteo Franchetti, the CEO of 8Sleep, which makes the $2,295 smart mattress topper The Pod, tweeted, Breaking news, the open AI drama is real. We checked our data, and last night San Francisco saw a spike in low-quality sleep. There was a 27% increase in people getting under 5 hours of sleep. We need to fix this. Source at 8Sleep Data. Franchetti's tweet reminds us that the pod is essentially a mattress with both a privacy policy and a terms of service, and that the data 8sleep collects about its users can and is used to further its business goals. It's also a reminder that many apps, smart devices, and apps for smart devices collect a huge amount of user data that they can directly monetize or deploy for marketing or Twitter virality purposes whenever they feel like it. The pod does, quote, intelligent cooling and heating for any bed, unquote, and learns and adjusts the temperature of the bed based on your sleep habits, tracks your sleep and vital signs while you sleep, and gives you a sleep fitness score based on your quality, routine, and time of sleep. As someone who often does not sleep well, the pod is a compelling product that I cannot currently afford. 
quickly to get it out of the way, 8sleep's data does not and cannot actually show that San Francisco had a spike in low quality sleep. What it shows is that people in San Francisco who have purchased a $2,300 smart mattress topper and have not successfully opted out of 8sleep's analytics, a group that surely over-indexes on tech workers, slept less Sunday night. The top of 8sleep's terms of service states, quote, At 8sleep, we pledge to respect your privacy and to keep your data safe. We only collect data that helps us improve our products and services, unquote. Both 8sleep's privacy policies and terms of service then go on to note that the company collects a huge amount of data that can be used for a wide variety of purposes, including marketing, retargeting, and scientific studies. It can also apparently be used by the CEO for commenting on the day's tech news. Specifically, the company notes that, quote, data about your sleep activity is transferred from your device to our servers, unquote, every time the pod's app syncs with the pod. Certain features on this device also require location data, quote, including GPS signals, device sensors, Wi-Fi access points, and cell tower IDs, unquote. This data is then used to give users personalized sleep recommendations, but they're also, quote, used in research to understand and improve the 8 device and 8 service to enforce the 8 terms of service, and critically, de-identified data that does not identify you may be used to inform the health and scientific community about trends for marketing and promotional use or for sale to interested audiences, unquote. The terms of service add that it, quote, may share or sell, unquote, this data. There is an incredible wealth of research that shows that de-identified data can sometimes be tied back to specific users or can, at the very least, be used in a way that the users don't expect. Whitney Merrill, who how I know through DEF CON, a privacy expert and information security lawyer, tweeted that she is reconsidering getting an 8-sleep pod because of Franchetti's tweet. And she said, quote, I'm sure it's aggregate and anonymous, but it just feels creepy. I don't want my health information like sleep data used this way, unquote. The terms of service adds that personally identifiable information can be shared with law enforcement if they receive a warrant or subpoena, which is common in tech company terms of service. But a reminder that generally mattresses don't collect data that can be used in legal proceedings. And I'll come back to that in a second. Eight Sleep's website shows that the company is regularly conducting and publishing scientific studies about the efficacy of its products. Many of those studies are done in more traditional scientific ways where participants are recruited and understand that they are part of a study. Eight Sleep did not immediately respond to 404 Media's request for comment. So yeah, that is, that's a big difference. And that, that actually is a theme that runs through a lot of these articles, if you go back and think about it, is... Sharing this data is one thing if it's done with explicit consent. It's not opt-in by default. You have to be convinced to do it, uh, and you are told exactly what this data is going to be used for, you know, like being part of a study. You know, that, that, that's a whole different thing. But a lot of our IoT stuff today is completely the opposite. They collect it by default. You're, there's something that you agreed to somewhere in the terms of service that none of us ever read. None of us could probably understand even if we did that basically gives them carte blanche to use this data however they want. And they will try to anonymize it. They often fail. It takes uh, maybe just a little effort to take some of this data and re-identify it. And this article says, kind of maybe cheekily, that, you know, mattress data isn't often collected by law enforcement, but I actually take issue with that. Law enforcement actually has gone to, let's say, Google or or Amazon and said, uh, there was a murder or something went down in this house and we see that they have one of your smart devices in that house, a smart digital assistant that records audio. I want all the recordings that were that were from this date and time. And if somebody was uh, having an affair and that was somehow related to uh, a law enforcement proceeding or if maybe somebody was murdered in bed or maybe some husband claims that their, you know, their wife died in bed of natural causes, but it turns out that they were actually choked or smothered or something like that. I mean, something like a smart mattress topper could probably factor heavily into that investigation. And whether this is related to law enforcement or not, you can bet that looking at that mattress data could tell when somebody was having sex in that bed. So the, the bottom line here is be really aware of, of what these health devices are doing, what kind of data they're collecting and what they could tell about you. All right, moving on. This is actually an old article. I think it was from 2017. I'm, I'm not sure what caused me to run across it recently, but I hadn't seen it back then. So it had some interesting points that I wanted to read it now. It's it's pretty short. It's written kind of strangely. It's from SDM mag. I'm not even sure what this is. It's some industry trade thing. And these are about people that 
do stuff with houses. I don't know. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't look into it, but it raised a really important issue. Uh, and so I kind of expurgated this and it's going to sound a little weird, but um, let, let me read this shortened version of this. Then I'll come back and tell you what I wanted to take out of this. While slamming some white castles, I read an article entitled Connected Homes Could Pose Threat to New Owners. The article starts off with a story about a lady who tries to set the thermostat in her new home to 70 degrees, but it always jumps to 80. It turns out that the previous owner was using his smartphone app to try to set the thermostat in his new domicile, but was instead setting the temperature at his old house. The article continues to detail some of the problems that can occur when IoT-equipped homes change hands. A quote from Charles Henderson of IBM X-Force Red neatly sums up the problem. Quote, as smart as the light switch is, it's not smart enough to know it's been sold, unquote. So let's consider how a typical IoT-equipped home's connectivity is configured. In most cases, IoT devices are Wi-Fi and achieve their LAN and internet connectivity through the homeowner's Wi-Fi access point or router. In the case of my house, my IoT devices, mostly IP cameras, are connected via wired and Wi-Fi, and communications fl flow through my TrendNet router Wi-Fi access point to an AT&T U-verse DSL adapter, which provides my internet connectivity. For the IoT devices to function, they need to be programmed onto my network. And in the case of Wi-Fi devices, they also need to have the SSID and security code input before they can access the network. Now let's say that I decide to sell my house and move. Once the deal is done, I'm going to shut off my AT&T internet service, and most likely they will want their adapter box returned to them. I am also going to disconnect all of my network head equipment, such as TrendNet router and switches. While I will likely grab the IP cameras sitting on the bookshelves, I probably will leave the smart thermostat and door locks in place. Now the new owner moves in and probably wants the IoT devices to be functional. This is a problem because they will not know the SSID and security code of Wi-Fi devices that were used and the passwords needed to access the devices, nor will they know the IP addressing scheme and passwords for any wired IoT devices. The new homeowners can attempt to contact the seller and maybe get the info, provided the seller remembers such minutia or has the info written down. I suspect in many cases, new homeowners will have to replace any IoT devices that are critical, like the thermostat, and may have to invest in new IoT equipment if they want a smart home. So that is an interesting thought that I hadn't really considered. I think of, you know, all my stuff as things I take with me when I leave the house. But yeah, there's going to be certain IoT devices like smart locks, perhaps mounted security cameras, thermostats, maybe some smart lights and smart switches, like outlets built into the wall maybe even smart appliances would stay with the home after I sell it. And it's really easy, honestly, to forget about those things, which is one of the reasons why the first step in my uh, securing your home network series of articles talks about enumerating and how you enumerate all the devices that are currently on your network. Because if you really get into the smart home thing, I guarantee you're going to forget about some. So a couple interesting takeaways from this. First of all, if you're buying a used home, uh, make sure you get passwords to any of the installed smart stuff. And you're probably going to want to know the SSID and password that was used to set up these devices from the old home because you might that might be the only way you're going to be able to connect to these devices to change their configuration. And the other thing is, I guess, if you happen to be a real estate agent, uh, you need to add this particular procedure to your home transfer checklist. But honestly, if it, if it were me, and I was buying a used home and it had any smart devices in it, I would just have them gutted. I would replace them all. I wouldn't trust them. I mean, there's still a chance that the previous owner might have some way to access them. Certainly things like thermostats and cameras or anything like that, would, uh, I would not feel comfortable reusing ones that were left behind by somebody else. All right, so moving on, uh, just a few more articles left here. Uh, this one's from Tech Radar, and it's about Apple's new name drop feature, and it got a lot of... A lot of weird, sensationalistic, clickbaity press on this, and most of it was wrong. So let me read this article to explain why. Apple's new name drop contact sharing feature is powerful enough to enable frictionless contact information sharing, but recent reports suggesting it's a privacy nightmare could be misleading. You just need to know how to control and use it. After a name drop uh, dropped with iOS 17.1 earlier this month, users of the best iPhones that actually updated to the new feature suddenly had the ability to share contact information simply by holding their phones and their best Apple Watches running uh, watchOS 10.1 within a few millimeters of each other. Within weeks of its arrival, though, local authorities around the U.S. began issuing warnings to parents of teens who carry these iPhones. According to a report in The Hill, 
police in Ohio posted this note on Facebook, quote, parents, don't forget to change these settings on your child's phone to keep them safe, unquote. The concern, obviously, is that predators could use name drop to nab personal contact information from unsuspecting teens simply by placing a phone next to the teen's phone. Of course, the reality is a lot more nuanced. Naturally, I think it's a good idea to always be smart about how and where you share your personal information, and that goes for teens and adults. However, there are already a number of safeguards built into NameDrop that make the surreptitious collection of iPhone contact information almost impossible without your express permission. First of all, NameDrop, which is actually part of Apple's AirDrop utility, uses the latter's default sharing settings. Assuming you've updated to iOS 17.1, you can navigate in, say, your iPhone 15 Pro settings to general slash AirDrop, and at the top you will see three sharing options, receiving off, contacts only, and everyone for 10 minutes. AirDrop, and as a result, NameDrop, defaults to contacts only. Obviously, this means that if someone is not part of your iPhone's contact list, they cannot connect to you through your AirDrop and NameDrop. You may be surprised to find that there's no obvious control for the new NameDrop. That's because it's also known in Apple's parlance as bringing devices together, a rather on-the-nose description of how to use NameDrop. In the description of the toggle, which is on by default, Apple explains, quote, Easily swap numbers with NameDrop, share photos, and more by holding the top of your iPhone close to another iPhone, unquote. The reality is bringing devices together does more than just name drop. It uses NFC or near field communication to make an almost instant connection between two phones held a few millimeters apart to enable airdrop style sharing. Whether you're using the phone for sharing photos or using name drop to share the new contact posters, which are pretty cards that include your photo and all the contact information, the key to protecting your privacy is in sharing controls. Prior to this iOS 16.2, if you selected everyone, it stayed on indefinitely, which led you to your phone showing up as an AirDrop recipient for anyone within Bluetooth and Wi-Fi radius. Now, even if you choose that setting to temporarily open your phone to all sharers, it automatically reverts to contacts only after 10 minutes. I also wanted to highlight the idea that people can casually grab your contact information by briefly putting their phone near yours is something of an exaggeration. It assumes you're leaving your phone unattended, which you should not, that people are remembering to position iPhones head to head, and that the contact settings are set to everyone for 10 minutes, and the contact thief manages to show up during that 10 minute interval. My advice to you is simple. Dig into your AirDrop settings, check your contact settings, familiarize yourself with NameDrop, and maybe try it out with family members and close friends also running iOS 17.1 or later. If you have no interest in ever using NameDrop, consider toggling off bringing devices together. With all this done, it's unlikely NameDrop will ever turn into a data and privacy nightmare for you. So yeah, basically, <laughs> while it's technically possible, it, that like in the situation that this article just ran you through for you to inadvertently give up your contact information to someone else, you really would have to go out of your way to do it. So it's another example of how somewhere someone misunderstood how this worked, got all upset about it, published some really crazy articles about it, and they went viral uh, and it just was overblown. All right, next up, I actually do have a little bit of good news here, and this is from nine to five Mac growing concern about Zelle scams and Zelle is the kind of the banking way of doing person to person payments like like Venmo or Google Pay or Apple Cash or whatever. Growing concern about Zelle scams has seen parent company Early Warning Services, EWS, that's an odd name, begin to refund some people duped into sending money to criminals. The U-turn on its previous stance that customers are responsible for their own transactions is believed to have been made in an effort to stave off potential legislation. The first thing to note is that scams, where people are tricked into sending money, are a different category to hacks, where a third party gains unauthorized access to an account. Federal law already requires banks to reimburse customers for fraudulent transactions they did not authorize. A scam is where someone has posed as a legitimate beneficiary, a government agency, a company you're expected to pay, a friend, a family member, in order to trick you into making a payment to them. Zelle originally said that it was the customer's responsibility to assure they were paying the right person and that the banks behind the app were not responsible. Under pressure from regulators and lawmakers to do something to address the growing problem, Zelle said back in August that it was introducing a new policy that would reimburse customers for quote-unquote specific scam types. The company did not at that point explain this policy. Reuters reports that Zelle has now specified its new policy and has begun issuing refunds. And this is a quote from uh, Reuters, quote, 
The 2,100 financial firms on Zelle, a peer-to-peer network owned by seven banks, including J.P. Morgan Chase and Bank of America, began reversing transfers as of June 30th for customers duped into sending money to scammers claiming to be from a government agency, bank, or existing service provider, said Erling Warning Systems, the bank's company that owns Zelle, unquote. This appears to mean that you will be reimbursed if the scammer pretends to be any government agency or any bank. However, it also suggests that if the scammer pretends to be a company, you will only get your money back if you are an existing customer of that company. Finally, it appears you'll be out of luck if the scammer poses as an individual, such as a family member or a friend. The company says that going this far is, quote, well above existing legal and regulatory requirements, unquote. The growth of Zelle itself and of scammers using the app have raised the prospect of regulation. Under pressure from Elizabeth Warren and other lawmakers, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, or CFPB, considered compelling lenders to reimburse scams. But Zelle's changes have so far satisfied the agency, said a person familiar with the matter. The CFPM has previously suggested that putting banks on the hook for scams would incentivize them to improve protections. And I'll come back to that in a second. The National Commerce Law Center says that legislation would have been better than accepting this voluntary agreement. And this is a quote from an attorney at, uh, at that center, quote, The one thing that I think is problematic is that the consumer really wouldn't know that they have that option. And if they do know, and if the bank fails to reimburse them, there is no private remedy, noting that Zell's policy change was nevertheless a good first step. Bank CEOs are due to testify to the Senate in December, and the issue of scams is almost certain to be on the agenda. So yeah, that's why I always recommend people use credit cards instead of debit cards for online purchases or or really for any purchases that that could potentially be a a scam. Because with a debit card, that money is gone. It's a direct pull out of your account. It's like writing a check. It's like handing cash. And at that point, while there are some protections with debit cards, your money is gone. You've got to convince the the issuing bank to, to give you your money back. But with a credit card, it's it's a loan. It's You're not out that money until you've actually paid the bill for it. And even then, after the fact, to a certain extent, you can still dispute those claims and, and, and often get your money back. And so, yeah, that's why credit card companies, because they're really on the hook for the fraud, have gone to great lengths to prevent that fraud from happening in the first place and to protect you from these scams, because it also ultimately protects them. And I think that that's probably a good idea. They're in the best position to fight fraud And therefore, if they have some skin in the game, they're much more likely to make these things more secure in the first place. All right, last up, this is an article from Malwarebytes. It's obviously a little self-serving, but but I think it has some interesting statistics in it that I wanted to bring out. And it's titled, Three Crucial Security Steps People Should Do But Don't. In new research conducted by Malwarebytes, internet users across the United States and Canada admitted to dismal cybersecurity practices, failing to adopt some of the most basic defenses for staying safe online. While some of the fault lies with the public, some also lies with the cybersecurity industry, which, according to the same research, has released products that people do not understand, do not trust, and most concerningly, do not use for their intended benefits. For our latest report, entitled Everyone's Afraid of the Internet and No One's Sure What to Do About It, We surveyed 1,000 people aged 13 to 77 about their cybersecurity and online privacy beliefs and behaviors. When asked specifically about the tools and methods that people use to protect themselves online, we found, disappointingly, that just 35% of people use antivirus software, just 24% of people use multi-factor authentication, just 15% of people use a password manager, and just 35% of people have unique passwords for most or all of their accounts. There's no denying the ugly truth here. These numbers are too low. And then it goes through their three things that you should do. Their first one, create and store unique passwords for each account with the help of a password manager. Strong passwords are a two-part problem. They must be unique for every online account and they must be remembered. Creating strong, unique passwords is simple enough as any person can throw a cat at a keyboard and likely fulfill the password requirements for most online accounts. Uppercase and lowercase letters, special characters, numbers, no addresses, pet names, or usernames. These specifications are no match for VN colon AE, and they give us their word password. Cheekily, it says in parentheses, no cats were harmed in the creation of this password. But remembering that password and remembering every password like it is physically impossible, as the number of online accounts and associated passwords that the average person can recall from its memory is just a handful. But the modern internet doesn't care about mental limitations. Instead, it demands an increasing number of accounts and passwords to manage for each person. 
The results of this constant tension are reflected in Malwarebytes' latest report. 24% use the same password, if possible, across all or most accounts. 41% have a few passwords that they use across accounts. The most obvious solution to this first part of the password problem, then, is a password manager. Password managers can create and store strong, unique passwords for all your accounts. And they can interact directly with web browsers so that you don't even need to individually open the password manager app every time you log into a service. Get a password manager and start using it specifically to create and store unique passwords across all your accounts. You physically cannot practice strong password security without one, unless you go to the pen and paper route, which is an entirely different conversation. Point two, use multi-factor authentication. There are two statistics that matter for multi-factor authentication. The first statistic was released in 2019 when Microsoft's Group Program Manager for Identity Security and Protection, Alex Weinhart, said, quote, Based on our studies, your account is more than 99.9% .9 less likely to be compromised if you used MFA, unquote. The second statistic was released this month when Malwarebytes found that only 24% of people use MFA. That number drops to 16% for Gen Z. Multi-factor authentication tackles the problem of password abuse in a very different way than password managers and password creation. Multi-factor authentication does not care if your password sucks. MFA will not make you use any special characters or numbers or uppercase or lowercase letters. MFA doesn't require you to remember anything. Instead, MFA stands between your account and the abuse of your password by requiring you to enter another form of authentication, other than a password, to log in. That means that even if a cybercriminal has your login information for your bank, that alone would not be enough to gain access. Instead, your bank would ask for a second form of authentication, which is typically a six-digit passcode that is sent to your device through a text message or email, or it is generated by your device with a separate app. Once you enter that passcode, only then are you allowed entry. MFA is available on nearly every single critical type of online account today, and it should be used for the services that hold your most sensitive information, including your email, social media, and online banking. And then their third one, of course, being Malwarebytes, was to use antivirus software. Now, I have a very love-hate relationship with antivirus software. I've talked about this many times before. I've got a whole article on this that's one of my most popular articles on my website called The Pros and Cons of Antivirus Software. Uh, I will put a link in the show notes for you to read that. The long and short of it is, I don't use antivirus software on my Mac. I just have good internet hygiene, and I follow some basic security practices that are outlined in my book, and then I've told you guys about multiple times. And that feels better to me because unfortunately, uh, modern antivirus software really gets all up in your business. And a lot of them are mining you for data. Some of them are actually security problems in and of themselves uh, because you have to give them full privileges on your machine to do what they need to do. And if they have bugs in their own code, they can and have been exploited. There have been many documented cases of antivirus software that itself was uh, the chink in the armor was the was the thing that was exploited to get into your machine. So I personally don't like antivirus software, but I tell you what, we're going to talk to uh, somebody about that coming up soon and a uh, security researcher, and he has his own opinion on that. So anyway, in the near future, we'll be covering that in an interview. All right. So that is the news. So that leads me to the tip of the week. And like I said uh, early in the show, I'm really going to make this super, super brief because I've actually talked about this in multiple cases on this show. But what I haven't done, uh, and this was and somebody asked me this, it was a dear carry question, or maybe just somebody email, email me about this. I realized I'd never really documented this uh, on my website as a blog article or in my newsletter. So I actually wrote a two part series about email aliases. The first one is already out, came out last night. If you're a newsletter subscriber, it's already sitting there waiting for you in your inbox. And, and I want to summarize it basically this way. Your login credentials for all your online accounts has two parts to it. It's got a username and it's got a password. And in the old days, we used to be able to pick our usernames. Uh, and that's why when a new service came up, you know, like Gmail or whatever, we kind of, you know, those of us who are into this kind of thing would rush to open accounts for these things so we could grab a good username because uh, they have to be unique across that entire service. And pretty soon the, the good ones are all taken, which is why there's, you know, Joe Smith 5005 and the real Carrie Parker 25, you know, because, you know, they're, they're all taken, right? The, they have to be unique. And so the people that grab them first get the good ones and everybody else has to get the leftovers. Well, somewhere along the line, we switched from usernames that people could pick to using email addresses. And that had some obvious advantage for the 
person providing the service. First of all, email addresses are guaranteed to be globally unique, not just within your service, but uh, unique around the planet. So that makes them easy. Second, that gives you a way to contact the user so you can send them a bunch of marketing crap. But also, you know, you, you probably don't want the contact information anyway. So why not just kill two birds with one stone and make the username the same as their email address? But also, nefariously, that gives them an identifier for you that is global. They can now use your email address as a unique ID to track you across multiple services because you probably only have one email address, maybe two, but that is very much tied to you as a person. And then everywhere you use that email address, it's now tied to you and they can correlate not just this one account, but all these accounts that are using that same email address. So from a privacy perspective and also from a security perspective, it can be good to go back to the good old days when we could choose our username, because that means that now the bad guys need two pieces of information to break into your account. And if you are the kind of person like Malwarebytes says, where you reuse passwords across multiple services, at least if you had different usernames across those services, the bad guys would have one more piece of information they would have to get to break into those other accounts, because they do use that knowledge that people reuse passwords all the time. And now the fact that people use their email addresses for their usernames mean that if I get your credentials for site A, and you're the kind of person that reuses your password everywhere, I can now take those same credentials and use it on sites B, C, D, all the way through Z, because people reuse that information. That type of attack is called credential stuffing or credential reuse. So what if you could at least change your username everywhere? Well, that's where email aliasing comes in. And so I'm not going to get into all those specifics here. You can read the article if you wish. I've talked about this before, but there are several services today, many of them free, some of them good, that allow you to create dummy email addresses that will all route to a single inbox. You don't actually have to have multiple email accounts, but you can have multiple email addresses that will all route back to one account. And these services now are built so that even if you reply to an email that was sent to your dummy address and then behind the scenes routed to your regular inbox, if you reply to that, it doesn't, it still doesn't give away your real email address. They do the magic by forwarding it back through their service to to swap back out your real email address for the dummy one so that the, the far end never actually gets your real email address. So there's lots of companies that do this. ProtonMail has this. They've got this when they purchase simple login. Uh, Firefox has something called Firefox Relay. Apple has something called Hide My Email. My Sudo has a service like this. Fast FastMail has a mass email service. There's a lot of these in there. And all of these are referenced and linked to in my article. Now, there's going to be a second article coming out in two weeks. Uh, but I'm not going to be here for that, so which I'll explain in a minute. And it talks about using a custom domain for creating email aliases, which is the route that I prefer. I actually use both these techniques, but I really like having a custom domain. That has some very interesting advantages over using these other relay services. For one of them being that once I own a domain name, which is only like 15 bucks a year, once I own my own domain name, I can make up any address that I want to, uh, any email address I want at that domain, and it will all route to the same inbox which means I can make them up on the fly to be whatever I want. And it also means I don't have trouble remembering it. Like if, some, if I'm at a brick and mortar store and I signed up for, you know, some department store's newsletter and they're like, okay, what was the email address you used? Well, if you use some of these dummy email address things, they generate these random addresses and you're not likely to know that off the top of your head. So anyway, there's a lot to this. It's a very interesting way to help protect your privacy and security. Uh, so there's part one of my series is out now. If you go to firewallsdon'tstopdragons.com, it should be the top article there. And in two weeks, the, the, the second one in that series will drop. So go check out those articles. It's a really handy thing to do. And it's something that everybody should at least know about. So there you have it. A whole bunch of news and your tip of the week. All right, everybody, I know we're already running long, but hang with me a little bit longer. I've got uh, a few important updates for you. So I've got basically the rest of this year is already planned out. Uh, I have needed to take a little time off. And so I worked really hard and worked ahead. And I now have every podcast for the remainder of 2023 already recorded and scheduled. I also have all my patron bonus podcasts recorded and scheduled for the rest of the year. And I even have my, my blog and newsletter scheduled out as well. So here's what to expect. The next podcast, December 11th, um, is going to be a really informative, uh, very important interview with Ben Adida from VotingWorks uh, on election security and also about trust in our voting system. That's It's crucial in a democracy. It's a very important interview. That's next week. You absolutely don't want to miss that. The week after that, December 18th, I'll be doing my annual Best of 2023 episode 
including some new commentary for me. So I went back and picked a handful of clips uh, from the best interviews from this past year and gave a little more commentary on them uh, as I introduced each of the each of the clips that I've been doing that for a couple of years now. But since I really, this year at least, I wanted to take off the entire month of December and just take a break. I also pre-recorded two other very interesting episodes. The first one is what I'm going to call my Wayback Machine. Uh, and if that, and if you if that triggers anything for you, it's there's also the Internet Archive, which has a tool called the Wayback Machine. But for me, it goes back to Bullwinkle and Rocky, where Mr. Peabody and his boy Sherman had a device called the Wayback Machine. So I've been doing this almost seven years now, this podcast. And so there's some really old material that I'm guessing most of you have never heard. So I went all the way back to 2017, the first year I did my podcast and found uh, an, an interview uh, with a guy named Ladar Levison, and he was the guy who ran a service called LavaBit. Actually, it's still around, and I'll talk about that uh, in that show. But basically, he ran one of the very first super secure and private email services, and one of his clients was Edward Snowden. And when the FBI came around in 2013 and basically was going to force him to give up not just Snowden's emails, but all of his customers' emails, he decided just to shut it all down. Instead of giving up the privacy of his customers, he just closed up shop. So it was a really interesting interview. It's still very relevant today. Uh, and that will be that'll be airing actually on Christmas Day, December 25th. And then on January 1st, I've got another best of 2023 episode. But in this case, it's actually the best of the bonus patron material. So as you must know, if you've listened to this podcast for any length of time, for my patrons, for my supporters, I have a separate private patron-only podcast. Uh, and that comes out on usually on Thursdays. It's, so it's every week. And whenever I do an interview, I get some bonus Q and a with my interview guests. And what I often do in the patron podcast is sometimes I'll, I'll ask them questions. I didn't have time to get to in the regular interview, but oftentimes I'll ask them questions that were completely outside the realm of the topic of the interview, like maybe what their origin story was or some, some interesting or uh, funny story from their past. So I went back uh, from 2023 and picked out some of the best clips from that bonus podcast, which as a regular listener, you would never have heard and put together some of the absolute best pieces of that. So just to give you a taste of what, uh, what my patrons have been getting and give you a chance to hear some of that content. Now for my patrons, I've actually got bonus content for them as well. So I've been doing a little series on the history of telephony because as a software engineer, I've worked on telephony most of my career. And so I've got kind of a, my personal take on some interesting parts of how the history of the telephone and how the telephone service works. The second part of that series will be this Thursday. And next week, as usual, I'll have some bonus Q&A with Benedita from the upcoming interview about election security. And then I also went back in the archives <laughs> to find, and I really had to do some searching for this. Before I did this podcast, I actually was a guest on someone else's podcast about privacy called George Orwell 2084. That podcast is no longer around. He quit. And because he had me take over his podcast, I changed the name, obviously. Um, but I took over his time slot on this podcasting network. And that's how this whole thing got started. And so I went back and I had to do some serious digging to find this, but I found my interviews with him uh, before I even had this podcast. And so my patrons are going to hear those clips. And then for my top level patrons, I've got this kind of special podcast called that I call Merlin's Musings. And it's really just, I call it that because it's vague and that lets me talk about whatever I want to talk about. Um, but the upcoming episodes for those guys in December will be talking about Tor and accessing the dark web. And then my personal take on how to do a technical interview, because I've seen a lot of them and most of them are done very poorly. So a lot of content is already recorded, ready to go and scheduled and will be dropping throughout the month of December. And I am going to take December off. So this will have another obvious effect. And that is if there's any hot news story that breaks in the security and privacy realm between now and the end of the year, I will not be telling you about it here on the podcast. So that's a great opportunity for you guys to follow me on social media, because that is probably where I will post something. If it's something that I think my audience needs to know, that is where I will post it. Um, most likely on Twitter and Mastodon and Facebook. And depending on how big of a deal it is, maybe some of my other social media as well. If you want to find out what my social media contacts are, if you haven't already followed me there, you can go to firewallsdon'tstopdragons.com and look for the contact tab. It's actually under the more menu. So you'll have to do a little bit of searching for it. But there it lists all my social media contact information if you want to follow me there. All right, 
just a couple more quick things. As I'm doing these best of episodes, I am trying to expand my audience and I'm going to be doing some sort of a promotion in January. And I think I might make this an annual thing. That's when I do my annual listener survey. Uh, that's when data privacy week is. And if I keep doing this take December off thing, you know, it, I think it'll just kind of make sense for January to be a good time to run a month long promotion where I want to, you know, try to expand my audience. I want to help more people. And to do that, I need to reach more people. So as these best of episodes are dropping, these would be great ones to share with friends and family or on your social media to give people a taste of what this podcast is like. So I encourage you to do so in December and January. That would be a huge help. Also, I have not gotten any new reviews on the book or the podcast in a long time, and those really do help. And recent ones are, are important. So if you have read the book and you enjoy it, please, uh, if you would leave a nice review for that on Amazon, I would greatly appreciate it. Even just giving it a star rating is great, but if you could actually even just a sentence or two about, about the book, that would be much appreciated. Same thing for the podcast. And the best place to do that is on Apple podcasts. That's where most people get them, or at least most people read the reviews. So I would also very much appreciate, uh, now would be a great time to do that, to leave a review for the podcast and or the book. I've already got a couple great interviews in the can for January. I'm going to be talking about slaughter bots or killer drones uh, with Nick Weaver. And I'm also going to be talking about Mac security with Patrick Wardle. And I've got some other great interviews uh, scheduled. So a lot of great stuff. If you have not already, definitely subscribe to the podcast. And that way you'll get all of that stuff automatically. All right, I've got to stop here. We are definitely running long. Uh, I hope you all have a wonderful, safe, relaxing holiday season and a happy, happy new year. Spend some really good quality time with your loved ones. Uh, if they need help on their privacy and security stuff, this is a great time for you to offer that effort for them. Show your love by, you know, giving the gift of time. And if you want to formalize that, you can go to fdsd.me slash coupons, and you can actually give them a coupon that'll tell them what you're going to do and give you a little checklist of things that will make that happen. If you would like someone else to give you such a coupon, you could also go check that out and request that on your holiday wish list. I'm sure most of you still have Christmas shopping to do as well, so you definitely want to be going back and taking a look at my best and worst gift guide for 2023. And uh, of course, you'll find that on firewallsdon'tstopdragons.com. And of course, there's tons of other great resources there as well. If you haven't poked around my website in a while, go check it out. I have definitely added things and moved some things around. And if you've never been, well, you definitely need to go because there's a lot of great stuff there. All right, that is it. I'm going to shut up. I know we've already run long. Again, have a great holiday, everybody. Take care. Stay safe out there. And as always, don't get caught with your drawbridge down. <laughs>